Okay. It's always good to see you on Sunday morning. And thank you for being a part of this worship service. Today, I would like to talk to you about our heart problem and God's solution through this message. The Bible says that humanity has a serious problem, and it's a heart problem. The heart has failed, it does not work, and it cannot be fixed. But the good news is that God has prepared a brand new heart that works perfectly for everyone who wants a new heart. All we need to do to receive this brand new heart is to trust God who is willing and able to give us the heart. And of course, we are not talking about our physical heart this morning. All of us know that our physical body has an organ that's called heart. It's the most important organ for our body. From mother's womb, until the moment of our death, our heart never stops working 24-7. One of the first things the medical doctors do when we go to see them for physical checkup is to listen to the sound of our heart pumping, uh, whether it has a regular, clear, and healthy movement or not. Just like our body has organs, our spirit also has organs. And just like what our physical heart does to our body, our spiritual heart is one of the major spiritual organs that govern our spiritual life. The Hebrew word for this spiritual heart is leb, L-E-B. Uh, broadly, it means inner man, mind, will, heart, understanding. Sometimes it's translated as soul. Ancient people used this word lab to talk about their inclination, their resolution or determination of their will as the seat of their thought appetites, of emotions and passions, and of courage. Basically, this word lab is the control center for human inner life, which eventually governs the outer life as an expression. Uh, here are some verses that help us to understand what Lev is and does. Uh, Proverbs 4, 23. Above all else, God your heart. God your Lev. So we can guard our heart the inner control center, for everything you do flows from it. It's very interesting. Everything we do flows from this heart. Jeremiah 17, 9 to 10. The heart, the lab, is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart, the lab, and examine the mind. The heart and mind, a different word. To reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. Because our conduct, our deeds, is done by the heart. The heart is the foundation. The lab is the foundation. And everything we do comes out of this heart. And Psalm 53, 1 to 3. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt and their ways are vile. There is no one who does good. God looks down from heaven on all mankind to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. Everyone has turned away. All have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Not a pretty picture about humanity, right? 
Our deeds, our actions display the reality of our heart. We do what we do because that's who we are. A thief steals, right? Why? Because that person's spirit, the heart, is filled with stealing. The same goes to all other areas of human life. We do what we do because our spirit is filled with that. Human heart, human inner being, has two characteristics, according to Jeremiah 79, as we already read that verse. And what are they? Number one, it is deceitful above all things. Number two, it is beyond cure. Deceit, which is dishonesty and deception, is the trademark of Satan. His name is deceit. And human heart is completely complied to Satan's control. My heart, without God's truth, is fully obedient to Satan. And your heart is the same. And that's why Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 2, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Talking about Satan. So it's like an autopilot program is set to one direction. There is no other choice. Everyone's heart is set to go to one specific direction. And that direction is to follow our spiritual enemy, Satan, unfortunately. Again, not a pretty picture of human heart, our inner being. See? And that's why education cannot solve this problem. Religion cannot handle this situation. Money does not help for the transformation of human heart. Whatever we may try, it just does not work until there is a total heart transplant surgery. Last week, as we looked through the book of Revelation from chapter 1 to chapter 8, we found out that God will pour out his righteous judgment upon this wicked world before Jesus returns to earth to establish his kingdom. Now, Christians have been eagerly praying for God's kingdom on earth as we have been reciting the Lord's Prayer for many centuries. Remember, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We've been praying this. God's kingdom established on earth. The Bible, through the Old Testament and the New Testament prophecy, tells us that God specifically set aside the seven-year period for this purpose. And many chapters in the book of Revelation deal with this seven-year period. Even though this is God's judgment, this tribulation, but this is not the final judgment. Before the final judgment, God wants to give humanity another chance. So this is God's final call to this fallen humanity before Christ comes again. So that they may have one more chance to turn their ways around, to look upon the Savior and turn to God by trusting in Him. God has been wooing, persuading, and reasoning with humanity for a long time to get them back to himself so that they might have eternal life. I mean, human beings, we were created for this eternal life. That's who we are. That's our purpose of the creation. But many have ignored his love call and rejected his offer of salvation. However, God is still merciful to them and gracious to them. So before Jesus comes again, God is giving unbelievers 
one more chance to receive eternal life by using the method that God never wants to use but has to, to turn their heart to the Savior. From chapter 6 to chapter 7 of the book of Revelation, we saw that Jesus opened the six seals on the scroll during the first half of the seven-year period. And here is the list of the brief summary of the events during this first half of the period. Number one, there will be a world leader who is going to be used as Satan's men during the seven-year period, coming on the scene and getting ready for his time. And number two, there will be also horrible wars and battles going on all over the world. We think there will be less battles and conflicts in human society and all over the world. On the contrary, there will be more wars, more battles, more fighting, more conflicts between human beings. It's a sad reality, and we don't want that, but that's the direction this world is going to. And three, there will be worldwide famine. And it's not hard to imagine, right? With current situation, all the wars and the global climate change. And it's going to be very hard to have you know, more food for humanity in this situation. So many people will hardly find food to eat, especially those who are financially weak. Yet, rich people will still drink and eat and do parties, the Bible says. And number four, then there will be worldwide plague and the breakdown of the ecological system in the nature, both in the air and on earth. As a result, one-fourth of the world population on earth will be killed. And what's astonishing is that after going through all these sufferings, still people will not turn to God, even though by the time they know that they are under God's righteous wrath. They know God is judging them, but they just don't come to him. Look at chapter 6, verses 15 to 17. After going through all these sufferings, then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it? You know, some people say, people don't believe God because they have never seen him. But that's not true. There are lots of things in life that we human beings believe without actually seeing them. We can't see the air we breathe. Yet we go other countries. We never visited before, knowing that we can breathe there because there is the air in those countries also. How do you know if you've never visited that country? We may not see God with our physical eyes, yet God has been faithful, proving himself real and true by his creation, through his prophets, and with all the good things that he has created for us so that we may enjoy them in life. The main and real reason people don't believe God is this. If they admit God's existence, then they have to make a decision, either to ignore completely him or surrender to him. And they don't want to do that. They don't want to surrender to God. That's why they don't want to admit that there is the creator God. They want their own autonomy, the Bible says. As we see in Psalm 53, only fools say that there is no God. Look at Psalm 53, verse 1 again, please. The fool says in his heart, again, the heart lab, 
the inner control center. There is no God. They are corrupt. Their ways are vile. There is no one who does good. The word full in this verse in Hebrews is nabal. Literally, it means stupid. And a little bit deeper meaning of it is senseless, not thinking right. Only those out of their mind would say, there is no God. As we can see in Revolution, uh, not Revolution, <laughs> Revelation, <laughs> so-called normal human beings, even under these sufferings, they know that there is God who is righteous and just, yet they don't want to admit it. Or even when they do, they still don't surrender to God. But God knows that some people will eventually turn to God, turn to him, when they face their ultimate sufferings. And that's why God will allow the second half of the seven-year period upon this earth, so that he may save them from eternal destruction. Now, in chapter 8, as Jesus opens the seventh seal, there comes the seven angels who receive the seven trumpets, of which the first one inaugurates the Great Tribulation period. Again, you know, seven-year period is prepared yet, not the first half, but the second half is called the Great Tribulation. The first trumpet is blown, and there comes hail and fire, mixed with blood, and it is hurled down on the earth. A third of the earth is burned up, a third of the trees are burned up, and all the green grass is burned up, people still not repenting. The second trumpet is blown, and something like a huge mountain, all ablaze, is thrown into the sea. A third of the sea turns into blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea die. And a third of the ships are destroyed, still not repenting. The third trumpet is blown. A great star blazing like a torch falls from the sky on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The Bible says the name of this star is wormwood. And I'm not sure what it is, but it's going to contaminate the waters, the oceans, the rivers on earth. And a third of the waters turns bitter, and many people will die from waters that become bitter. Still, no repenting. And fourth trumpet is blown. A third of the sun is struck a third of the moon and a third of the stars, so that a third of them turn dark. Now, from heaven, the suffering also comes, not just on earth. And a third of the day is without light, and also a third of the night, and still people not repenting. So the chapter 8 ends with the fourth trumpet, and chapter 9 begins with the fifth one. And from fifth trumpet, tribulation becomes much worse than what's already worst. Up to this point, most of the sufferings are natural disasters and man-caused calamities. But from the fifth trumpet and on, even unknown living beings are summoned to be used as a tool of the tribulation. A lot of scientists have been diligently working to unfold the mystery of God's creation on earth and its effect that we human beings have come to know so much about so many things in nature. But contrary to what people think, still there are so many things that we don't know about our planet earth beyond our imagination. The Bible tells us that there are beings in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. Look at this scripture as Paul talks about the Lordship of Jesus Christ in Philippians chapter 2, verse 10 to 11. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven 
and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, in the name of science, we human beings have just scratched a little bit of what's on earth so far. We have no idea of what's in heaven and what's under the earth. As the fifth the trumpet is blown, a star that fell from the sky to the earth is given the key to the shaft of the abyss. Look at Revelation 9 verse 1. A fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. Pay attention to the tense of the verbs. The star fell already from heaven, and it has been on earth. And now he receives the key to the channel of the abyss. He can open the door of abyss. From this text, we don't know what this star is or even who it is. The Bible talks about spiritual beings as stars a few times, and I think we may get some ideas on what this star may be through other parts in the scripture. But for now, let's just say a star. And the Bible often talks about abyss, right? Even in the New Testament. Uh, some other translations translated it as pit, P-I-T. General meaning of abyss is a hole in the ground. But the biblical sense of the word is that it's a place deep down under the ground or under the sea where human beings cannot reach. We don't really know what's living there. But there are some things there, apparently. And not just natural beings down there. There is even a spiritual connection with the word. For example, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8, there is a scene in which this word abyss appears. And I'm sure... You can jog your memory of the scripture, the New Testament. When Jesus and his group went to uh, Jerusalem, a town that was across the lake from Galilee, there was a demon-possessed man from the town who lived in the tombs. When this man saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet and said, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you. Don't torture me. He said this because Jesus already commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man. This evil spirit's name was Legion because it was not just one demon, but many demons living in the man's body. And what's connected to our message from this story is that these many evil spirits begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. From this, we can assume that the abyss is not a vacation place for the demons. It's a kind of holding cell or prison to the evil spirits. Anyway, the key to open the abyss is given to a star that fell from heaven. When the star opens the place, smoke rises from it. And out of the smoke, locusts come down on earth with a power like scorpions. And these locusts are not allowed to harm the grass or any plant or tree. They can only harm those who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads for five months. And the pain is so terrible that people rather want to die, yet they can't. They cannot die, but suffer the pain, which is more horrible than death itself, for five months. Then the sixth trumpet is blown, and there comes a great world war. We talk about World War I, World War II, but these two world wars, cannot be compared to the world war that is coming. 200 million of the mounted troops are out there to kill. And one third of world population is gone 
by this word and violence. Look at the text, the Revelation chapter 9, verses 16 to 19. The number of the mounted troops was twice, 10,000 times 10,000. I heard their number. John heard the number, so the number must be accurate. The horses and riders I saw in my vision looked like this. So he was trying to describe it as much as he could. Right? Their breastplates were fiery red, dark blue, and yellow as sulfur. The heads of the horses resembled the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and sulfur. A third of mankind was killed by the three plagues of fire, smoke, and sulfur that came out of their mouths. The power of the horses was in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails were like snakes, having heads with which they inflict injury. In verse 17, John used the word like. The mounted troops looked like something hideous. If they are a kind of modern weaponry machines, then they could be tanks or something like that with a lot of firepower, possibly nuclear power. Or they could be something totally different from man-made weapon system. Whatever they may be, they are going to kill so many people that one out of three will die from them all over the world. Yet, what do people do? Do they repent and turn to God for mercy? No, they still have their own way. That's the reality of human heart. They show the exact image of our natural state without God's grace and truth. Look at verses 20 and 21 that we read this morning. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshiping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, idols that cannot see or hear or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. Human beings keep doing all the wicked things even in the midst of such tribulation. Even death cannot change the nature of the human heart. Only God can. And that's why Jesus died on the cross. He died as the representative of our old heart, even though he had no sin. When Jesus died on the cross, our old heart also lost its life. The sin-bound, rebellious heart, so deceptive and evil by following Satan, that heart is now gone forever on the cross. When we say we believe the power of the cross of Christ, that's what we believe. We believe that our old heart is gone. It has no more life, no more power over us. And this point is very important and a must because without the cross of Christ, there is no resurrection life for the new heart. If we want to experience the power of the new heart in Christ, then we must recognize and believe that our old heart has been done by Christ on the cross. Without passing the cross of death, there is no experience of new life. We all want to experience the newness of our salvation that the Bible talks about. Then before anything else, we must come to the cross of Christ first. There, our self-centered, self-governed life has been done completely once and for all. If we truly believe that, then we will have no difficulty in experiencing the power of new life in Christ. Everything was done by Jesus Christ, and our portion is to believe what he has done for us. And that's why the Bible says we are saved by grace through faith. Would you close your eyes and bow down your head before the Lord? 
And would you answer to this question to yourself? Do I truly believe that my old heart is done and gone completely in Christ? Or is it still something that I am trying to make it happen by my own strength? Let's remember that there is no other way to change our heart but the cross of Christ. And the power of new life is available to those who believe this truth wholeheartedly. And let's pray. Father, thank you for the cross of Christ. There is no other way but Christ. Our unbroken heart has been broken by Jesus when he died on the cross for us. We believe that truth. Thank you for the gift of this new heart of obedience. Since our old heart is gone away through the cross, there is no difficulty in believing our new heart in Christ through his resurrection. Father, we are now new creation in Jesus Christ, full of joy and victory. That's our confession. Your life is already working in us, even in our body. There is power, there is hope, and there is healing and restoration in this new life. And as we declare this truth by faith, your power is mightily working in us even this morning. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your healing grace. Thank you for your peace and joy. Thank you for the faith that you allowed us to have. We will walk by faith. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.